the Old Testament to the New Testament, from the beginning to the end, there is a theme. And the theme is that of the message of our Savior. A message that started all the way back in Genesis, it ends in Revelation. And it reminds us as Christians that we are to be strong and courageous, not to be terrified, and to continue to share the gospel with the world around us. Today, one of the very reasons why you and I have one of these in our very hands is because of a courageous Christian many, many years ago. There was a, a man by the name of William Tyndale, and Tyndale was a, a brilliant man. He was a, a brilliant linguist that could have spent his days as a scholar, but instead he died as a martyr. He was born in 1494, and Tyndale, Tyndale, he had a, a passion from a very early on in his age. And that passion was for people, for ordinary people like you and me, to be able to have the Bible in their hands, to be able to read the Bible for our very selves, to read it in our own language. You see, in the, the time in which William Tyndale was growing up, in the days in which he was an adult, then the only people that could really read the Bible were those of the, the priest and the bishop and, and maybe those that were highly educated. The Bible was primarily uh, translated into the Latin language. And so the, the common people, they couldn't read it. They didn't even have a copy of it. And William Tyndale didn't think that was right. And so he made it his goal to begin translating the Greek New Testament. He started right there in the New Testament. And he began translating that New Testament into the common language of the people. And the bishops, the priests, the uh, clergy of the day hated it. They, they couldn't stand what he was doing. And eventually, there was a price that went out on his head. Now, how many of you would like to have those preachers over you? But here was that there was a price that went out on his head. And he still translated the New Testament every single day on the run and hiding wherever he was at. And finally, on February, in February of 1526, he was able to release the very first 6,000 copies of the New Testament in the English language. A bishop was so angry about what had happened, he was able to get a message to William Tyndale, and he said, I will buy every single one of your New Testament. His whole purpose was to buy them all and destroy them. The mistake was the bishop said, I will pay any price. And Tyndale took him up on the offer. And he sold the New Testaments at an exorbitant amount of money. And he took all of that money and then he made a higher quality New Testament. And he translated even more copies and got more Bibles out or more New Testaments out all over the country in England. The Bible was being smuggled in in flowers of sacks, or in sacks of flour. It was being smuggled into homes, into countrysides, and bundles of corn. And finally, King Henry VIII of England knew that they had to put a stop to it. And so he sent everyone that he could out to find William Tyndale. And eventually, they caught up with William Tyndale. And he was put to death, all for translating the New Testament into the common language of the people, into the English language, so that you and I could read it today for ourselves. In 1536, he was burned at the stake. And his last words that he proclaimed was, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. And that prayer was answered. Two years later, the king, the king had decided that it was now time to put a Bible in every church and every home throughout the country. And he commissioned the translation of the entire Bible into the English language so the people could have it. It's what you and I know today as the king James Bible, first released in 1611, all because of one courageous Christian 
that would ultimately pay the price of his very life so that you and I could read the Bible in the English language. What an amazing Christian. When we hear these words from the Old Testament in Joshua 1, 9, be strong and courageous, maybe we don't think of it in that way. But William Tyndale did. And you and I today as Christians, the time in which we live, these words have a different meaning and a new meaning. To be strong and courageous and not to be terrified in the time in which we live. There are so many overwhelming things that come our way. There are so many things that seem to go on all around us that we can't wrap our minds around. But what we do know, what we do understand as Christians today, is that there is no greater time than here and now to be strong and courageous and not to be terrified. The Lord compels us in the time in which we live to be courageous and stand for the truth in the face of lies, to be strong and courageous with our words and our actions, to be strong and courageous in leading our families and leading our churches, to be strong and courageous when it comes to investing in our communities, when it comes to encouraging one another. If you don't believe that now is one of the greatest times in all of our history as a nation to be strong and courageous, then think about this for a moment. There's a a study that was released not too long ago by George Barna. And in that study, he found that 77% of Americans say that religion is losing its influence in America. Not only that, he also found that 74% argue that the state of moral values in our nation is getting worse. How many, you, how many of you think that may be occurring? Not only that, but the study goes on, and, and he found that 57% recognize that religious freedoms are being more restricted because of activist groups that are moving society away from traditional Christian values. And then finally, the study released... It observed that 77% of Americans are concerned about the future. I wonder how many of you sitting here today are concerned about the future. When it comes to our culture, when it comes to your faith, when it comes to just basic ethics and values. We look around us and we know that these words that echo from the Old Testament to the New Testament to the days of William Tyndale to you and me still remain relevant, be strong, and courageous. So now is the time for us to choose to make a difference. To make a difference with our words and our actions. To make a difference for future generations by what we choose to do today. And so today we're going to look at three truths of choosing to be a courageous Christian. As given from the Apostle Paul, the advice that he gave to a young Timothy in the days in which Timothy lived, a day in which he faced great, great opposition, and a day that needed very much courageous Christians, just like the time you and I are living today. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand with me, and we're going to look at this text just for a moment. It's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. It's a, a short verse, but here's what it has to say. The Apostle Paul would write these words, and he says, You then, my child, be strengthened. Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. And then he said, think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Let's pray. Dear Father God, we thank you this day. We give you praise. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your truth and your love. And we thank you for the opportunity we have to be able to gather together this day and to study your word. I pray that you would give us strength and courage as we depart here today and as we leave and go our separate ways, that we would be strong and courageous right where we are at and that we would choose to make a difference for you and your glory in the time in which we live. And so this day, 
give us courage. This day, give us strength. And this day, give us wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing for the Word of God today. The big idea that we're going to wrestle with as we begin looking at this text today is this. Choose the Lord and His ways. Choose the Lord and His ways. He is the one that provides strength for the storm and courage to conquer the chaos. So in the time in which we are living, in the time in which we face, we realize that the most important thing that we can do, the most important choice we can make to make a difference is to choose the Lord in His ways. As we begin examining this text, there are three truths that we're going to look at that really remain relevant for you and me. The very first truth that comes to us as we begin looking at verses 1 and 7. You see, I want us to look at the very first verse and the last verse as kind of the bookends of this passage. As we begin looking at the text, we see that it is here that the Apostle Paul, that he begins encouraging Timothy to arm himself, to arm himself with wisdom, to arm himself with strength, to be able to overcome any obstacle, any trial that he faces in the days ahead. And to do that, it requires wisdom and it requires understanding. Because each and every one of you, you understand and you know that you can arm yourself with the wrong thing and it can end in disaster. How many of you could testify to that? And you could arm yourself with the wrong wisdom and you could end up in failure. And so Paul comes along and he begins encouraging Timothy to arm himself with the right strength that will help him endure, to arm himself with the right courage that will help him stand in the time in which he was living For that time for courage was then, and it was also critical in the day in which he had. As we begin looking at the text, we look here at verse 1, and Paul starts out, and he says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The phrase that he uses here in the Greek language, to be strengthened, it carried the idea of a a very vigorous strength, of a, a continual strength, that Timothy, whatever he was to do, was to continually be strengthened on a daily basis with the right kind of strength, that he was to get up in the morning and he was to put on the right strength for the battle that he was going to encounter, the battle that he was going to face. And it carried that idea that he was to do this with a great zeal, with a great passion, with a great intensity. And every day that he would get up and arm himself with the right strength. As the text goes on, we realize that this was not new advice. That Paul gave this same kind of advice to Christians of all backgrounds, of all generations. In the church of Ephesus, in Ephesians 6.10, he gave Christians Similar advice when he said, finally, be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. But the the question we have to ask ourselves is, what in the world does it mean to be strong in the Lord? I mean, what does that really mean? Well, anybody that's been a Christian for any amount of time realizes that being an effective Christian in a wayward world, it comes down to preparation. It comes down to preparing yourself here and now for the battle that you're going to encounter tomorrow, the battle that you may not even know anything about, but you know it's coming. And so to be that effective Christian, to be strong in the Lord, to be strengthened by the Lord, means that we do something today to prepare us for tomorrow. The unprepared believer ultimately becomes a defeated believer. And so the strength, the strength of the Christian life The secret of really being strengthened by the Lord, it comes down to depending on the Lord, to dependence upon God and His ways and His will. And so, how do you be strengthened by the Lord? How does this occur? Well, number one, you choose to trust the Lord. Now, that's easier said than done, is it not? How many of you say it's really a simple concept to wrap your mind around, trust the Lord? How many of you agree with that? Don't raise your hand if you disagree, by the way. But the idea, right, is that we know we are to trust God. We get it. But is it easier said than done? 
What do you think? Yes or no? It's a lot easier said than done. We know that we are to trust God, but there are so many times in our lives where we trust in our own strength, our own wisdom, our own power, our own endurance more than God. We say, oh, no, 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 that would never occur. How many of you have ever got the cart before the horse, if we're going to use that phrase? Anybody ever have that happen? How many of you have ever taken matters into your own hands and jumped ahead of God's plan? Because you wanted to help them along and you wanted to speed up the process. Let's be honest, you really wanted to speed up the process, right? How many of you, Mary, you've never been impatient in your life, is that right? Oh, see, there it is. Never been impatient in her entire life. But here it is. To be strengthened by the Lord, we've got to trust Him. That's step number one. The second step in really being strengthened by the Lord is we've got to seek Him. You know that old passage of Scripture in Matthew 6, 33? Seek the Lord and His kingdom. And all of these things, everything that you really need in life, everything that you really need for provision, it will be given to you. But seek the Lord. Trust Him. Seek Him. Again, it's easier said than done. But what we have to realize is to be strengthened by the Lord is not just to trust Him, but it is to really seek Him. And then we understand that it's not just to trust Him, and it's not just to seek Him, but it's also to obey Him. Oh, man, there's the kicker right there. You mean i got to obey God's Word? Isn't it enough just to be convicted by God's Word and we can stop at that? But you mean i got to do something about it? And so here it is. You want to be strengthened by God. Then it takes trust. It takes seeking Him and His will and His ways. And yes, it even takes obeying Him. It takes obeying His Word even when it is difficult. And times when it's easy and times when it's difficult. And times when it's comfortable and times when it's uncomfortable. And when you choose to be strengthened by God in this way, then you will make an eternal difference. And so, Paul tells Timothy, be strengthened. Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It's not the sum of our strength that we have that is important. But it's our source of strength. And so what is your source of strength today? In Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so that's maybe why Paul comes to verse 7, and he wraps it all up by saying this. Think over what I say. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. It's interesting because the Greek word... In the New Testament, to think over, it means to perceive clearly with your mind, to understand fully, to consider carefully. And what Paul does is he gives all of these instructions, and here in just a a few minutes, as we get done looking at all of verses 1 through 6, Paul wraps it all up and he says this, whatever you do, think carefully over what I have told you. Whatever you do, prepare yourself today for what is coming tomorrow, but think carefully and clearly about what I just taught you because it will make an eternal difference. Whatever you do, think clearly. You know how important that is in the time in which we live? We are being bombarded by every distraction under the sun, are we not? And in the time in which we live, we need to be reminded to think clearly and to think carefully upon the Word of God because it gives us instruction to make an eternal difference. And so, truth number one that we see here is that courageous Christians gain steadfast strength and wisdom from the Lord. Courageous Christians, they gain steadfast strength and wisdom from the Lord. Charles Spurgeon was known as a prince of preachers, and he once said that wisdom is the right use of knowledge. To know is not to be wise. 
men, or many men, know a great deal, and are all the greater fools for it. There is no fool so great as a knowing fool. But to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. When was the last time we thought about wisdom that way? I bet all of you can look around in your life today and you know people that have great knowledge but are complete fools. Do you know somebody like that? If you're married, do not look to the person next to you, right? (laughs) The reality is we all know people like that. Wisdom isn't just the accumulation of knowledge, but it is the ability to be able to think clearly and carefully about what you've been taught and what God gives you as instructions to make an eternal difference in the time in which you have, because our time is short in this world. So what will we do with the time we've been given? And what will we do with the knowledge that we've gained? The second truth. The second truth that actually comes to us as we look at verse 2. And verse 2 comes along, and and the apostle Paul, he, he comes to Timothy, and he says this. Now that you have been taught this very valuable lesson about putting on the strength of the Lord, about about being strengthened by the grace of, of Christ Jesus, then, Timothy, whatever you do, pass on your understanding. Pass on what you have learned to future generations. But don't just pass it on, teach them. Teach the next generation, teach others, teach faithful men and women how to understand and what to do with the Word of God. And this is what he says, he says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust, or carefully teach in the Greek language, to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The second command that Paul gives to Timothy, it declares that the Word of God is to be passed on from one generation to the other. The early preachers of the church clearly understood this charge. The leaders of the day, they echoed what Paul had said. They understood that the Word of God needed to be correctly interpreted, and it needed to be correctly taught. That it needed to be clearly proclaimed and rightly handled in a world that had gone wrong. And not it only needed to be taught to the the current generations, but also future generations. And today we see that the same principle applies, that the same truth is still relevant for you and me, that the Word of God needs to be clearly taught and passed on to future generations. What's really interesting to entrust to faithful men, that word in the Greek language, to entrust, it means to show to be true. Otherwise, to carefully teach in such a way that people would know the Word of God to be true. Not just assume it to be true, but know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is absolutely 100% true. And it is. History shows that the Word of God is true. Archaeological evidence shows that the Word of God is true. We go throughout history and we see the evidence that points to this reality. The Word of God is true. And so Paul says, here's what you are to do for future generations. You want to make a difference? You really want to make a difference that goes beyond your last breath? Then here it is. Show the Word of God to be true in the eyes of your family, in the eyes of your friends, in the eyes of your neighbors, in the eyes of strangers. But show it to be true by the way you live your life by what you say, by what you pray, but show it to be true. And that one little word in the Greek language, to entrust, it also carries this idea. To set it before others like that of an amazing meal. To set food before others. And I love to have that idea in my mind that every time that I am to teach or preach or every time that you are to go out and even be with your family, that you are to set the Word of God before your family like it is that of a precious meal. 
that you have together. That you carefully lay out everything. You carefully savor every bit and piece, knowing how valuable and precious it is. It is. And today, this little command, this little principle, is more critical than maybe ever before. The latest studies tell us, and I just researched it again in the last few days, 51% of preachers, 51% of preachers in America today have a biblical worldview. Let that sink in for a minute. Now remember, a biblical worldview has two main components. That you believe the word of God is true. That's kind of a big one, right? And that you live out the word of God. That's truth. Belief and action. So, 50% of preachers who are teaching God's word, only 50% believe it's true and lives it out as if it is true. In 2004, the study showed 43%, somewhere right in there, 48%. Today, it's about 51%. But here it is, 51% of preachers. Do you think this is critical for us to understand today? Do you think this little command that Paul gave Timothy all the way back in his days is more relevant now than ever before? Yes. And so today... We've been given a great, great challenge. A great challenge that we must carry out in the time in which we live. To lay out the Word of God in a careful and understanding way for those we love and make an eternal difference. Truth number two is that courageous Christians, they teach absolute truth as found in the Word of God. Courageous Christians teach absolute truth. It's found in the Word of God. And here it is. We finally get to the last point. And all God's people say, amen, right? And this should only take us like another 20 more minutes. Isn't that great? And here it is. We get to the last point. And what Paul does is he wants to bring the principles home in an understanding way for Timothy and all those that would hear. And so he uses three very important illustrations in verses 3 to 6 to kind of make the Word of God come alive for them. And he says, you want to make a difference. You really want to make an eternal difference. Then not only be strengthened by the Lord our God, not only teach truth to others, not only stand for truth, but he says, be like that of number one, a soldier. And look at what he does here. He says, no soldier, in verse 4, gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. The imagery of a soldier is one who is willing to obey the orders of his commander. That he's disciplined, that he is obedient, that, that he focuses on certain key operations that he has been instructed to carry out, and he doesn't get distracted, he doesn't get sidetracked. Man how important that is today. But also, the imagery of a soldier was one who was willing to sacrifice his life for what he knew to be right and true. For the very order that he was given, he would even lay down his life. So he says, you want to make a difference? Then be ready to sacrifice all for the Lord. Then he gives a second illustration. He says, if that doesn't relate to you, maybe you need to be like an athlete. An athlete that's not disqualified for the prize. You see, the imagery of an athlete is someone who prepares and trains themselves. In the the New Testament times, uh, those who would prepare for the games, those who would prepare even for great races or, or great athletic competition, they would train vigorously for the competition at hand because everybody wanted to win the prize. And actually, the idea that was used there, that they would discipline themselves, it carried the idea that they would strip away anything that would entangle them. So literally, and I want you to understand this, they would literally train naked. 
Because they didn't want anything to entangle them. They didn't want anything to stand in their way of being the best that they could be. And so that's what they did in the New Testament times. Man, aren't you glad that people don't still do that today, right? But here it was, they didn't want anything to stand in their way. And so the athlete was the one that disciplined themselves, they trained themselves, they prepared to win the prize, they prepared to finish well. And Paul says, you want to make a difference? Be like the athlete. Train yourself spiritually. Train yourself in godliness and finish faithfully. There was a, a story all the way back in 1980, April the 21st, 1980. There was a, a young lady by the name of Rosie Ruiz. How many of you have ever heard of Rosie Ruiz? She was an individual, a, a woman that actually won the Boston, Boston Marathon in 1980. She ran the Boston Marathon faster than any other woman had ever run the Boston Marathon before. She was so fast that people didn't even remember seeing her in the race. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. When she crossed the finish line, when she crossed the finish line, there was one reporter that was trying to put everything together, didn't remember seeing her throughout the race, and one reporter was bold enough to take his microphone, put it right in her face, and he said, ma'am, you are either the fastest woman alive or you are a fraud. You think that reporter kept his job? He sure did. Because it was just within a few hours that two students from Harvard came to race officials and said, we saw Rosie Ruiz in the crowd, and we saw her making her way through the crowd, and a half a mile before the finish line, she stepped out of the crowd and onto the race course. She finished the race. One freelance photographer said, I remember seeing Rosie Ruiz on the subway. And I asked her, I said, you look like you're uh, part of the Boston Marathon. And she says, oh, yeah, I was a little bit injured, but, but I'm okay now. And when the people finally investigated, when the race officials finally investigated, they disqualified her because she did not prepare herself and she did not compete according to the rules. As a Christian... Whatever you do, do not be disqualified. Don't be disqualified for choosing to live life your own way and by your own standard. Live. Live according to God's word. Live to give him glory. The final example that Paul gives us is that of a farmer. The farmer who was willing to pay the price to plant the seed for the harvest. The one who was willing to put in all the hard work and all the efforts to care for the crop and do what he could, knowing that it was still in the hands of the Lord. And being promised that the spiritual reward that would come from God would come from a job well done. And so he says, you want to make a difference? And do this. Be willing to pay the price to plant the seed for the harvest that is coming. And so we learn from all of this that you and I, we are called to live our lives to make a kingdom impact for the glory of God. Plain and simple. So truth number three is that courageous Christians, they live life to make a kingdom impact. I don't know what you're living your life for today. And to be honest, you may listen to all of this and you may say to yourself, well, I'm still going to do it my own way. But you really want to make a difference that lasts far beyond your last breath. You want to make an eternal difference that will impact generations down the line. Then choose to live your life to make a kingdom impact. You'll never regret it. And it will always be worth it. And so as we get ready for this invitation time, it's a time for us to respond to the Lord. And here in just a moment, we're going to stand. And for those of you that need prayer today, we invite you to come forward. And we have individuals that are ready to pray with you. Maybe you need prayer for yourself or a friend or a family member, whatever it may be. We invite you to come forward, and we have people that will pray with you today. And still some of you out there today, maybe you've never given your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord.